Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. We're heading into hurricane season, so we thought we would talk with our resident hurricane expert here, Sean Bellafuri. Now, if folks don't know, Sean, why are you such so big into hurricanes and tropical stuff? Uh, well, the, the short answer is uh, when my family moved from New York down to Florida in 2004, uh, my mom abandoned me in before <laughs> Hurricane Francis. Uh, so she was uh, selling the house up in New York and you know they had to close and Hurricane Francis was bearing down. Uh, and within about a week of me staying down there is when the storm mm. hit. So you kind of get a passion for it. And so we're, we're about to head into uh, hurricane season. For folks that don't know, why, why is hurricane season from June uh, starting up through the summer months? Well, traditionally, um, during the hurricane season, you know, we're talking about the amount of heat that we get in the oceans and especially around the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific, the Northern Hemisphere summer, you know, initially when we were starting out, the sea surface temperatures are coming out of winter and it, this isn't like the air temperature where one day we'll get a 100 degree high and then the next day it'll be 75. It takes some time for the water to build up. So when you start to get into late April and early May, that's when the sea surface temperatures start coming up. And then once you start to get into May, June, July, and especially uh, August, September, October, that's when the sea surface temperatures are the hottest. And you also get these big storms that kind of come off of Africa, which they got all that water to go through. So, um, you know, the hurricane season, it, it, it's I like to say it's time lagged a little bit to summer by about two months. Yeah. So you're talking about the warm sea surface temperatures for for a tropical system. They 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 like warm sea surface temperatures, but they also don't really want any wind shear really to, to build. Right. Right. So when we, we talk about uh, severe thunderstorms and tornadoes, we usually talk about wind shear and of course about the heat as well. The wind shear in a tropical system is just the worst thing it can do because if you think about severe thunderstorms, they have to get maintained by an updraft and the updraft doesn't get disrupted if it gets tilted a little bit. But when you're talking about hurricanes and all of this warm and humid air that's rushing into the center of the system, any sort of disruption is is going to cause it to not be perfect, so to speak. Um, so when we we talk about the wind shear, high wind shear causes the eye wall to break down. And once you start to get dry air penetrating into the eye wall, that's when the systems start to weaken. And kind of it's kind of like a moat. It, mm. it really is when we look at it on radar. Um, you know, you can kind of see that that's just the defense. It's the the eye is is it and then the eye wall or your, your lineman. Yeah, so last year was kind of an average year, but then we had one major storm really mixed in. What what is your takeaways from last year's hurricane season? Last year was a little bit of a, a stumper, I think, honestly. Uh, we had a triple dip La Nina, which, I mean, I'm, I'm only 30 years old, and 30 years, that's, we've never really had three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back La Nina years. Uh, La Nina is bad for, you know, humans mm -hmm. in, in terms of hurricane <laughs> seasons. Great for hurricanes because the wind shear goes down and uh, typically you get some pretty warm sea surface temperatures too. So last year, everyone was anticipating that we were gonna see another just like breakneck year. 2020, 2021, we had, you know, two dozen storms plus each year. And last year it looks like it was gonna be the same thing, but we just never got the showers and thunderstorms in the right spot. But at the same time, we did eventually end up with about an average year of, of hurricanes. And it's just unfortunate. Every single year, you know, we could say that there's going to be 25, 30, 10, 5 hurricanes in a year. But if that one hits you, it's a bad day. Yeah, yeah, because we had a bunch, but they were all out in the Atlantic or in areas that weren't affecting the U.S. And then, yeah, Hurricane Ian completely <laughs> changed that yeah. uh, view. So you were talking about La Nina. We're in the process of switching to gradually to El Nino. What, what kind of changes does that make when it comes to hurricanes? So when we talk about uh, El Nino and La Nina, it's actually not a weather pattern. I, I, I personally don't like to call it a weather pattern. It's a sea ocean pattern. What happens is you either get warm or cooler than normal waters off the western coast of South America and depending on if it's warmer it's El Nino, if it's cooler it's a La Nina and that influences our weather. So when we're going into this El Nino pattern it's kind of the opposite. You know we expect a lot more hurricanes and tropical storms when we get to a, a La Nina but when we're talking about an El Nino it's usually reversed. Now in the eastern Pacific because of the warmer waters the hurricane season is usually a lot more active than the Atlantic but 
the Atlantic could still have these powerful storms, uh, hurricanes, even during an El Nino year. So you get the warm sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. That causes wind shear uh, to form across a lot of the tropical Atlantic, which like we mentioned a little bit before, that wind shear really just helps to disrupt these systems, but it's not the end all break all. If you get a storm that forms and the wind shear isn't there, then the sea surface temperatures, as long as they're warm enough, it's still going to be a, a strong system. So we're kind of expecting kind of an average, if not slightly below normal kind of year. Is that what it looks like? Yeah, at, le at least all of the, the preseason forecasts that we have seen, be it from Colorado State or the forthcoming NOAA one, um, it, it's expected to be average. And I think part of the reason for that is because not necessarily we have El Nino, where the wind shear is going to disrupt the activity. We have a lot of warmth across the Atlantic Basin, the, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Ocean, or the Caribbean Sea, rather. Um, close to home, especially in May and June and August and July, of course, too. Um, it's those storms that form in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico that have the best chance of impacting central Texas. Now. El Nino doesn't really bring a ton of wind shear to those areas, so the Gulf of Mexico and uh, you know the Caribbean Sea, where we have those warm sea surface temperatures, if we don't have the wind shear and something forms in there, it could very well be strong. And then when you start to get into the Caribbean Sea or the Gulf of Mexico, the storm has to go somewhere, and it's 99% it's of the time going to go over land. It, so a, still an active season, probably close to average. just. We're probably not going to get those long track or quite as many of those long track storms that come off of Africa and take about a week and a half to get close to any other landmass. So, you know, thus being here in central Texas, you know, folks don't think hurricanes and impacts on us, but what, what kind of impacts if a storm made landfall, let's say anywhere along the Texas coast, what kind of impacts would it have more inland in an area like us as those storms move in? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the big thing with Texas is that it's big. <laughs> you know, second largest state, you know, it's got a huge coastline. So the way that hurricanes and tropical systems work is that they are sometimes lopsided. You typically get the worst weather wherever the system makes landfall to the right of the eye. So if it's coming, you know, straight from the south, that means that the eastern side is going to get worse than the western side. So for central Texas to get really impacted by a hurricane or eventually a, a tropical system because it moves inland, you really need it to make landfall somewhere between, I would say, about Corpus Christi and Houston. Mm. Houston's, uh, you know, depending on the angle it comes in, that could ride right up I-45 and impact central Texas. But uh, usually the storm systems that impact the western Gulf of Mexico, they either go straight inland you know, directly like east to west, or they kind of get picked up by the jet stream and kind of curve away from us. We saw that most recently uh, with Hurricane Harvey. I mean, granted, that's a, a, a big storm that sat for a couple of days, um, but, you know, the, the path that that system took, it kind of rode slowly eastward and pulled away eventually from us. So if you're looking for impacts inland, uh, you know, maybe 40, 50 mile per hour winds, you know, very heavy rain, the potential for tornadoes, for us, uh, that needs to be kind of a south central Texas landfall. Yeah, you were speaking of that. So back in 2005, Hurricane Rita well, the first forecast had it coming in about Corpus Christi and curving right over our area and everyone was freaking out because it looked like a lot of rain. Kept shifting east mm -hmm. and then went across East Texas and then we were on that drier side and had record breaking high temperatures and no rain at all. So, uh, yeah. well, y'all can see our, why we call him our tropical expert <laughs> and this is just a little tip of the iceberg on it. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated here as we continue and uh, find on kwtx.com those forecasts. But Sean, thanks for spreading some of your knowledge out there and letting us know, got to let him nerd out a little bit about uh, the tropical systems.